Welcome to Cold Harbor, Virginia. In uh, late May to early June of 1864, Grant met the Confederate forces out here at this battlefield, which happens to stretch about seven miles in length. And currently, I'm only on a very small portion of it that the National Park itself um, owns and operates. Uh, this section was about 10 miles north of uh, Richmond, just slightly north of Richmond. And it's near the site called Gaines Mill. The Seven Days Battles actually happened out here in this, in this area as well. And the battle park itself is set up in sections. There's little portions you can go to. The Battlefield Trust has done a lot to actually um, preserve much of this battlefield that they can. Um, but as it sits right now, the portion that we're gonna go into for the National Park Service is just a very small portion of that battlefield. I'm walking across the field and in front of the final defense works for the Confederate Army here at Cold Harbor, Virginia. And directly behind me, um, if you can see them there, the cannons, that would have been Major Reed's four-piece artillery section. And he described the field in front of where he was as a generally flat open field. Um, it's much like the wheat field actually when you're out here walking. It's uh, flat, slightly rolling across the field and the Union soldiers that were coming across or trying to reach this point here were basically being mowed down by Major Reed's artillery section. And they were falling like wheat before the reaper, as it was described. Now to set this up as we're walking across the field here in Cold Harbor, Virginia, um, Grant was working Lee South in a series of battles that was part of what we call the Overland Campaign. Now during those series of battles, he was essentially hitting Lee where he was and then backing out of the position and moving to another location. And Lee was having to play defense and going further south, which takes that army out of Northern Virginia and takes the threat away from Washington, D.C. But during that series of battles, the Union Army suffers roughly 50,000 casualties leading up until this point. May 28th through May 30th, Lee and Grant get into a, a tug of war, if you will, at a place called Totopotomy Creek. And that kind of sets us up to where we're here in Cold Harbor. And uh, the battle commences here on June 1st but a series of uh, issues with the Federal Army ends up messing the plans up for Grant and delays that battle. And when you come to this battlefield at Cold Harbor, it's gonna be kind of hard to imagine the size of battle. In Gettysburg, the majority of the battlefield is preserved and it's, it's easy to drive the length of the battlefield and the town and put yourself in the position of the soldiers. But here, it's not gonna be that easy. Only a small portion of it's preserved. The Federals had roughly 108,000 soldiers here during the battle. And then the Confederates had 62,000 soldiers here during the battle. So that's close to 200,000 men fighting each other throughout these fields and woods here in Cold Harbor, Virginia. And that's why this battle stretched out over seven miles of uh, field. And um, it's pretty hard to preserve a battlefield that's that, that large, really. Directly over here behind me, there's a zigzag pattern. It's, it's so small on the ground, uh, so shallow. But that's all that remains of the actual zigzag pattern 
earthworks that are out here for the soldiers that were built by the Union soldiers in 1864 for the Federal Army. So by 1864, warfare has changed quite a bit. When the soldiers came across this ground in 1862, um, generally the way a battle worked was a, a soldier would go shoulder to shoulder with the others. They would go across the field, ordered by generals to attack, and a battle was typically won or lost by some kind of a dramatic charge across the field. And the team with the, the biggest loss or casualty count was the team that usually lost the battle. But here we are in 1864, and now the uh, old soldier that they called Granny Lee was using the new tactics to the best of his advantage um, with these trenches, and trench warfare became the name of the game. So where I'm standing right now is a pretty significant portion of the battlefield. It's one of the only surviving uh, portions of trenches called turn trenches, which is basically a line of trenches that were captured by Union soldiers and then turned into a trench for the Union soldiers. North Carolinians were out here and they frantically dug these trenches to begin with um, to prepare for the assault that was gonna happen on June 1st of 1864, but eventually the 6th Corps would push up through this section here behind me and they would capture the earthworks that are right there. Um, they're not very big, they're shallow because of all of the erosion over time, but there's a bridge here placed over top where you can actually walk over the top of these trenches. In this area here, it's much easier to see the earthworks that are left behind on the field. And when you visit a place like this, you need to stay off these earthworks because erosion over time, especially with people trampling on top of them, will break them down and destroy them forever. And you'll never be able to see them again. Now, June 1st, uh, Sheridan gets into a, a fight with Hoke and uh, Kershaw. And the, the fight itself was a half-hearted fight. The Confederates really weren't in it. But what that causes is it causes Grant to think that there is more hope for a fight here than there really is. So, as a result, he ends up ordering Baldy Smith's 18th Corps, Wright's 6th Corps, and uh, to strike the defenses here in the Cold Harbor area. The orders were confused, however and the roads were pretty bad. So they end up arriving late. And it's not until about 5 p.m. that day that they are actually able to get online and start the attack. And directly off in the ravine right here in front of me, it's kind of low-lying depression. You can see it runs sort of down like this. Um, on the afternoon of June 1st, 1864, Thomas Klingman's North Carolinians and William T. Wofford's Georgians attempted to hold this position, but they failed to hold it. The Union soldiers of the 6th Corps actually took advantage of the weakness here and captured this area and were able to push the Confederates back to another line of defense. So Wright 6th Corps briefly breaks through the line, but the Confederates quickly repulse him. Um, General Meade then orders up General Hancock to make a forced march overnight, and they're roughly about 12 miles from this position, or this town and Hancock marches his men all night long and doesn't arrive until out here uh, at about 6.30 a.m. the next day on the 2nd. So his men were in pretty rough position at that point. They're extremely exhausted and tired. They had just come out of another position where they were fighting, and now they're moving into this location here, and it's being acknowledged that uh, the 2nd Corps is pretty ragged by the time they get here.
One reason why I love coming out to Coal Harbor so much is the different types of earthworks that are on display here. And you can actually see what they are based on the sign uh, signage that's out here. The sign behind me details that this small depression in the ground that's right about here, I don't know if you can see it on camera or not, but that small depression is actually a rifle pit from the Civil War. Um, this was the forward most position, if you will, of the Union soldiers that are out here. Uh, that forward most position means that those men are in those rifle pits and they are on guard in advance in case something happens or Confederates are coming across this line and trying to attack the main line in, in the cover of darkness. If those men fall asleep in those pits, then it's possible to take this line by surprise. And so if you're put on guard and you're out there in that pit, it's pretty much a guarantee that you are not going to get some sleep that night. So June 2nd, General Meade orders Baldy Smith into an early morning attack. Um, Smith actually refuses the attack, says that it's not a good idea because there's no real military plan for the attack. And then uh, Hancock arrives at 6.30 a.m. and persuades Meade to push the fight until 5 p.m. so they can get everybody online and have a good order of attack for this fight here. General Grant coming out and seeing what's happening and realizing that Hancock's Second Corps is extremely tired, decides to persuade General Meade to have the attack the next morning on June 3rd. General Lee realizing that he had an opportunity at hand for June 2nd, uh, ends up strengthening his earthworks, his defenses over here. So he builds a lot of earthworks that will end up saving his army at this attack here. And the, the positions that he put the earthworks in would actually create a possible enfilade fire on the soldiers as they were coming up through this area. Imagine, if you will, you are a Confederate soldier. And you're out in these woods. You're out in this area here where the, the defense work is directly in front of me, right there. And you're a sharpshooter. You're so close to the enemy lines that you can actually hear them talking right over there. And every once in a while, somebody pops their head up and the sharpshooter reaches over top and fires and takes somebody out. That's what it was like here, June 3rd through June 12th in this position at Cold Harbor, Virginia. So it's June 3rd, 4.30 a.m. and the Federals finally decide to launch their attack. And at the time, you're looking at the 2nd and 6th and 18th Corps that are going to be here on this field launching the main attack. The only problem is the terrain a lot of them are having to go through is just like the uh, bogged down ravine that we just saw earlier. They're getting tangled up in the brush, the underbrush that's inside the forest here. Some of them are getting bogged down in the swampy areas and it's slowing down the progress of the men as they're marching through and breaking up their lines because at the time, the men coming online had to be a coordinated effort because of Napoleonic warfare, and that's how it worked. But they were not able to get their men online at the exact same time, and as they're coming up here, some of them are unsupported, and some of them have to spread out and fill up the gaps, and they are being mowed down by the Confederates that are in the earthworks that have already been built, rebuilt, repositioned and strengthened within that 24-hour period where no fighting was to take place. This stream that runs behind me, directly behind me here, would be called Bloody Run by the soldiers that fought here. It winds throughout this battlefield in this area here, the portion that the National Park owns and uh, controls. And the reason why it was called Bloody Run was because this was some of the only places that soldiers could actually lay down in a depression and try to save themselves from the firing that was happening on the hill directly in front of me. And if you look behind me here, 
you can see directly across the street, the hill goes dr directly up and there's artillery and muskets on top of that hill at that time in 1864. But this creek right here behind me was called Bloody Run because of the blood that ran in it and turned the water to red. A lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat happened out here in this area. And this is one of the rare places where hand-to-hand -hand combat did take place during the American Civil War. And it was an awful sight. And a lot of men remember the color of the water that ran through this stream and talked about it and wrote about it. Now, in that initial assault that happened on June 3rd, when we talked about the uh, Wright's men, we talked about the 2nd Corps, the 6th and the 18th. During that initial assault, about 7,000 casualties happened within a 30 minute period. Um, that's a lot of casualties coming across this field. And it had a lot to do with the position that they were attacking. The hill that I'm climbing right now and trying to keep my breath while I'm doing it is one of the main reasons why. Because of the position of the artillery and the defense works that they were trying to take. Again, another set of unique earthworks out here at Cold Harbor. Directly behind me, the rise of ground, that's right back there, behind me here. Um, was the main Confederate earthworks. And I'll turn around and there's a sign here that tells you all about it. But there's a depression right there in the ground directly in front of that sign. Let's see if we can get it in there. That depression was a covered walkway or covered earthwork going straight down to the second main line. So the first main line's up here on the hill. They have a covered way that men can go underneath and walk in here and the mound of dirt on either side is covering them and protecting them from fire coming from either side as they're going down to that second line and they're going back and forth between the two lines uh, between june 3rd and june 12th here at cold harbor another story that i read about earthworks out here has to deal with uh, the union soldiers and how frantically they put together their lines during the assault while they were out here, there was a lot of dead men on the ground. And the Union soldiers were pressing and attacking a position that was already heavily reinforced. So as they're out there, they're having to dig this dirt up and mound it up as quickly as possible to protect themselves from sharpshooter fire, cannon fire, and to keep themselves alive any way that they can. An unfortunate part of that is they're trying to use anything they can get their hands on which could be trees, dirt, what have you. That's normal. But some of the things I read also included the bodies of their comrades. They would stack their bodies up and place them in there and then put the trees, the dirt, and the earth around them and use that as something to fatten up the earthworks that they were in uh, in order to protect themselves from dying. It's a real sad situation. So around 12.30 p.m., General Grant decides to ride the lines and see the thing for himself. He gets out here and he starts to realize that the assault that he's ordered is not successful and it does not make military sense and it's only throwing more bodies into the fight that are going to die across this field so he decides to go ahead and cancel the rest of the plan for that day as far as attacking these lines up here um, and then they pull back into their positions and between the 3rd and the 12th of June 
they're constantly skirmishing with each other across these fields, sharpshooter fire and things like that, doing the best they can until General Grant decides to pull out of here on the 12th. And then that would start one of the greatest moves that he made during the Civil War by getting his men across the James River and over to Petersburg, Virginia and start the siege that would eventually end the Army of Northern Virginia and Robert E. Lee. So thousands of casualties already on the field and nowhere to go for the Union soldiers cramped inside of these, these trenches that they made for themselves. General Grant and Lee decided to have a truce for about two hours on June the 7th. And the purpose was so that Grant could send his men out and pick up the soldiers that they'd left behind on the fields and try to help the ones that they could help and maybe have burial parties for the others if they can. Unfortunately, it was a little bit too late for a lot of those soldiers and many of them bled out on the fields here in Cold Harbor and died of an agonizing death. Uh, there were very few survivors left out here on the field that they found on June 7th. At the end of this battle, the Union Army had over 12,000 casualties across these fields. The Confederate Army had a little over 4,000 casualties, roughly 4,500. The death toll was pretty amazing and staggering for such a small period of time. It wasn't until 1866 when a commission was created to have men come out here and dig up the bodies and place them into a cemetery that a lot of these bodies were found. And there's no doubt that still to this day, there are probably remains out here on this field that have not been found. They're still buried in the exact same place that they were during the Battle of Cold Harbor from June 1st through June 12th. In Grant's memoirs, he would write about this place. And he would say that this was one of the things that he absolutely regretted in his lifetime, especially as a commander of men, that they gained absolutely nothing by fighting here at Cold Harbor. And that he regretted the deaths of his men here at this place. This is an amazing place to visit. There's several loops and walking trails here at the National Battlefield for you to go to. And then there are other locations preserved by um, the Battlefield Trust, and signs throughout by the Civil War Trails organization. Come on out here to Cold Harbor and check it out for yourself. It's been fun taking you out here. Signing off once again, History of Waffles at Cold Harbor, Virginia. <laughs>